Good day, everyone. I thought I'd start with a brief introduction. My name is Yandori Kruger. I am uh, a researcher um, and head of the Department of Linguistics at Macquarie University in Australia. Um, my background is, is a little bit different. I started out in South Africa uh, working in the field of uh, English literature and then eventually transferred into research more on audiovisual translation and in particular more recently uh, on the, the processing of language in multimodal contexts. So today I'm going to just give you uh, a brief introduction to a few of these issues, multimodality, um, audiovisual translation, but particularly the uh, studies on the processing of audiovisual translation products. So I'm going to um, share my screen with you. And that is not the right screen. Yeah. Okay. So the topic of today's talk is uh, broadly audiovisual translation as multimodal mediation. Uh, this is roughly based on a keynote paper that I delivered at the Media for All conference in Stockholm in 2019, I believe. Okay, so um, you here, yeah, because you're interested in research and specifically in the fields of uh, language or multimodality audiovisual translation areas like that. Um, the reason that, that this is an important and interesting area to investigate is really because of the fact that um, there has been a digital revolution uh, in with the advent of video on demand in particular. Uh, it's really transformed the way that people engage with the world around them through media, the fact that you no longer have to wait for scheduled programming. Uh, you can really watch whatever you want, whenever you want it, on various streaming platforms. Uh, this has meant that people are starting to engage with multimodal texts on various platforms, more and more platforms and devices, uh, and in, in various contexts. So uh, in this particular scenario, what it means is that we, we have a boom in the use of audiovisual texts um, from very informal uh, short snippets on Instagram and things like that to YouTube to uh, formally produced uh, content that were made specifically for streaming platforms like Netflix, Prime Video, Stan, anything like that. Um, and as a result, more and more people are getting more access to audiovisual content, but uh, there is also more access accessible content. So we have more products available with, um, with subtitles um, and, and similar services added to it. In the case of subtitling, this has meant that subtitling has boomed. Uh, there's an increasing move towards automated subtitling so that you can, with a press of a button, get access to audiovisual content with, uh, with subtitles added to it. Um, Another important aspect here is the, the rise in things like fan subbing, uh, where fan subbing has taken on a much more prominent role. Fan subbing together with crowdsourcing of subtitles. So um, what has happened is that there has been an explosion in content and also an increasing need for subtitles in terms of multimodal intercultural mediation. So what does this meant for audiovisual translation? ABT is short for audiovisual translation. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with the term. So uh, what has happened is that we have universal or near universal access um, to specifically to audiovisual content through the internet. And this has resulted in amateur subtitlers, audio describers, multinational companies, content providers, to prioritize economy, volume, speed, efficiency, and very often over quality and immersion. In many countries, there's legislation that uh, 
stipulates exactly what percentage of content has to be made accessible through subtitles and, and audio description and other means. Um, and in this quality is not always the first priority. So if we look at verbatim subtitles, for example, in other words, word for word subtitles, where the subtitles are simply a transcript of what is being said in that particular video, then uh, what we find is a really variable subtitles in terms of quality, in terms of speed, um, in terms of many other aspects. According to Romero Fresco, uh, speed in subtitling for the deaf and hard of hearing is as much a technical matter as it is economic from the perspective of broadcasters and service providers, political and also ideological uh, in the context of, of deaf associations. So the demand for verbatim subtitles, um, however, is not limited to subtitles for deaf and hard of hearing, where the audience would feel cheated if, um, if anything is left out or changed. Uh, viewers also demand full and accurate transcript of the dialogue when they use subtitles uh, and they're not a traditional audience for subtitles. In other words, you have access to the audio, you understand the language, but you still switch on the subtitles if you a user like that, then very often any discrepancy between the dialogue and what you see in the subtitles is going to jump out at you. So this has led to, to quite a charged debate, um, but we don't really know that much yet about what the actual impact of various things like uh, increased subtitle speeds and things like that is. Recent studies, however, have started to engage with the impact of things like presentation rate on processing and, and beginning to get a better understanding. If we just for a moment pause uh, at the concept of media accessibility and access, we can say that, that we're witnessing astonishing volumes of subtitled material that is being produced for a day on a daily basis both formally and informally. Reality TV that seems to be unscripted but isn't very often. Um, uh, various other platforms and uh, in educational formats as well where you have increasing volumes. There's an increasing role of technology, but there's also an increasing variability in quality. Uh, importantly, however, we have an increase in access. And, and that is uh, a very positive outcome of the digital revolution. So with this increasing access and increasing volume, we do have a need to see how subtitles function as multimodal mediation. Uh, and this is no simple matter. Subtitles only present one element, one component of film as a multimodal text. The majority of advances in the automation of subtitles, however, tend to shift the emphasis only onto the transcription of speech. So what you're do, doing is you are uh, privileging and prioritizing the dialogue, the spoken word, over the other elements of a multimodal text. And in some cases that can be problematic. Uh, not always. The visuals don't always carry as much weight. Uh, when you're listening to a lecture like this, for example, the visuals are sometimes important and sometimes they're not. Sometimes the voice carries all of the meaning. Sometimes the text that you find on screen merely confirms what you have. On the other hand, if you have fiction film, if you have drama, uh, then a lot of the meaning is contained in the visuals and we need to pay particular attention to that. Um, if we look specifically at presentation rate, as we've discussed, Already, uh, verbatim subtitles have resulted automatically in uh, very fast subtitles at times. Uh, because if you're just going to transcribe every word that's being said and you are faced with a speaker with a high speech rate, then inevitably the subtitles are going to be much faster as well. So what I'm going to do in today's talk briefly is to introduce eye tracking, what it is, and some research on eye tracking. I'll give you an overview of some of the studies on subtitle processing. I'm also going to introduce you to a preliminary model, a multimodal integrated language framework to see how do we understand it as a cognitive, uh, from a cognitive basis, 
uh, on a psychological basis, the way people deal with multimodality. And then also I'll talk to you a little bit about the methodology and the findings of a couple of studies that we've been doing in our lab at Macquarie University. First of all, though, audiovisual translation and multimodality. In audiovisual translation, we simultaneously process spoken and written language, but also the soundtrack and visual information. So, of course, what we have here is verbal information, nonverbal information going through different channels presented in different mediums. So, if we look at the subtitles, then the information that are present in the subtitles depends on, but it also supplements or even repeats what is available in the other modes. And this changes very rapidly in an audiovisual text. It's not like a multimodal book where you're reading the book and then you're looking at pictures, you're reading at the text and looking at pictures or a, uh, a website, a multimedia website, for example, where you can click on hy hyperlinks. You're always processing one element at a time at a pace that you decide is comfortable, but you decide it's comfortable. When you deal with audiovisual translation or with subtitles, then the viewer doesn't really have much control over the speed of presentation. So uh, film, of course, is dynamic. And therefore, because of the fact that it's dynamic, you have to con constantly prioritize sources of information. You can't take in everything at once. And we'll get to the reason for that in a moment. If we look at the background uh, and some history on eye tracking in audiovisual translation, then um, you'll know or you will see that eye tracking has gained quite a lot of ground in media accessibility research over the last few decades. It originated really in the 1980s through the work of Jerry de Deval uh, and his colleagues in Belgium. And it has grown rapidly and it now includes a range of different measures and in very diverse research designs. And it's also inspired a number of, a number of very novel avenues of research and, and application. Uh, this has also been helped along by the increasing ac access to technology. Subtype uh, eye trackers have become much cheaper and there are uh, more and more eye trackers on the market that can answer certain research questions uh, without really uh, being all that expensive. Also, more and more universities uh, seem to have eye trackers. That uh, means that it, it is possible to get access to this as a researcher. Now, early studies in audiovisual translation really focused on attention distribution, uh, looking at how people dis distribute and divide their attention between the subtitles at the bottom of the screen and then the image. Um, but really at global levels to say, this is the percentage of time people were looking at the screen and this is the percentage that were looking at the subtitles. Or alternatively, counting the fixations, how many individual fixations, in other words, that time when your eyes relatively still and you can take in information, how many times have people shifted their gaze and had different fixations in the different areas. Um, there has been more interest on uh, recently on, on other measures as well. So what happens when you use different translation strategies, more foreignizing or domesticating, for example, strategies? How does that impact the way people read subtitles? What is the impact of things like shot changes? When you have a sudden change of scenery, does that change the way you read the subtitles? Um, text segmentation, the placement of the text, the presentation seed of speed of subtitles. All of these things have become more and more important in research on audiovisual translation using eye tracking. Uh, and then uh, a common theme is also in more recent work, the impact of subtitles on the effectiveness of visual processing of the form. So to what extent does reading the subtitles impact your ability to process the visuals? And, and we'll look into that a little bit more later on as well. So, uh, and then of course, the amount of cognitive load induced by reading subtitles. So how are subtitles read? Previous studies on subtitle reading were concerned with uh, viewer responses. So more attitudinal, how do people feel about reading subtitles? 
attention distribution, and there are a few studies there. Cognitive processing, um, again, a, quite a number of studies more recently looking into those aspects. But let's take a look first at visual perception and, and why subtitling could be a really useful tool. Visual perception is limited. Uh, we very often have the idea that it isn't, that if you are sighted, that you can really see a great deal in front of you. There's a lot of visual complexity sometimes around you, and you can take all of that in. Uh, and, and this is largely an illusion that's created in your mind because of the way that your mind can really put together a collage of different single snap images um, and create the impression that you can see everything in definition. But really, you can only see a very small window in enough detail at any time to extract meaningful information. And for that reason, and if you pay attention to your own vision, you can see that you shift your, we have to shift your gaze very rapidly and, and very often to, uh, to extract meaning from a complex scene. So if you're looking at subtitled video, it means that you have to actually look at the subtitles to be able to read them. And when you read them, you can't necessarily follow what's happening on screen. You have to shift your, your, visual, your gaze between uh, subtitles and, and images. So um, this is really what we're interested in when we use subtitles, uh, eye tracking to study the reading of subtitles. Now, just a very quick exercise. If you look at that sentence and you look at the first word on the left, this word just, if you look at that word, then without moving your eyes, there isn't much that you can make out. You can't, you can read to some extent, if you focus on the middle of the word just, you can make out how, and you could potentially see much as well. But you have to, if you want to see anything further than that, you have to shift your gaze to land on, say, the third word much, then you can see the rest there. And it looks something like this. If you look at the beginning at how, you can see a little bit to the left and a little bit to the right, but then it becomes less and less uh, visible. Um, and it looks something like this. Now, this is, of course, not perfect, but this is roughly what it looks like. Where you look is in focus, the rest is in less focus. Um, it doesn't physically look like that, but if, you, if you're if very honest with yourself, you can also see that if you look at the beginning of the line, there's no way you can know what is two or three words to the right of where you're looking, which means that you have to shift your gaze. Now, why is this important? When you looking at subtitled video and you're looking at a text like this uh, and you're looking at the subtitle at the bottom of the screen you can look at the kangaroo and have that in your mind so you know that what is on screen is a kangaroo which means that when you're reading the subtitle you have no problem looking at the kangaroo and seeing if the kangaroo moves without looking directly at the kangaroo but if something were to happen specifically uh, maybe a kangaroo is not the best example, but if this is a human and there's a facial expression that changes, there's no way you can judge what that facial expression is. You can maybe see peripherally that something has changed, but you can't see what it is unless you shift your gaze to look directly at the face. And the same time, if something interesting is happening up here and there is text at the bottom, when you're looking at the face of the kangaroo, there's no way you can read the text at the bottom unless you look down at it. So that is what makes the reading of subtitles such a complex issue. If you look at the way vision works, then you can really only see about one to two degrees uh, of uh, the area of about one to two degrees of foveal vision, which is if you have your, eye, your arm out at arm's length, then it's about the size of your thumb, your thumbnail. Um, that's the only part that you can really see in high definition. Um, which means that you can see that in definition and the rest is really your peripheral vision. And in your peripheral vision, you can pick up things like danger, like, like a fast movement, like a sudden change you can pick up, but you can't make out a lot of detail. So you have the, the central, the foveal vision, then <clears throat> around that, which is a few degrees further, two to five degrees, you have um, the parafoveal vision, 
where you that's part of your perceptual range and it means that you can actually still make up things in that area uh, which is why you can if you're looking at the word was in that image you can also to the right of that see uh, two words to the right little you can see in focus if the sentence is um, the sentence the middle is there was a little fox and you can see the middle of that then um, you can see a little bit to the left, two to three characters to the left, and you can see about seven or eight characters to the right, you can make out letters. But outside of that is your paraphobial, it becomes your peripheral vision, and, and there you can't make out that much. Okay, so then again, back to eye tracking. Why is eye tracking important in research in this area, in processing of multimodality? Without an objective measure like eye tracking, it's really hard for us to, to make conclusions about comprehension, cognitive load, immersion, things like that, uh, because you don't really know what people were looking at. You need to have that objective measure because eye tracking reveals where viewers are looking and how they, for example, read subtitles. But this remains an indirect measure if we're only looking at lower measures. So if we're only interested in average time spent looking at a particular aspect or dwell time, the fixation count, how, num how many fixations, uh, the duration of fixations, the number of times people cross over between different elements of the screen, those are global measures and they are very indirect. It becomes more direct if we need to answer questions like, how does first language versus second language, um, the layout of text, speed, how does that impact on, sorry, no, let me backtrack. You can answer these, the following questions using global measures. In other words, how does first language, second language, how does speed, how does layout, how do these things impact on the overall processing of subtitles? Um, but then if you want to look at the more, uh, local measures, then you can start looking at how many words are skipped. And you need to have word level data for that. How many words are not processed? Um, and then if the words are, how are these words and phrases processed? Uh, how many are, are they just skim read or are they read in detail? Do we have refixations or don't we? Are there regressions? All of these things require you to have more local measures. Um, and if you have that, then you can also start looking at how video, how soundtrack, uh, how complexity of the scene, how redundancy between subtitles and audio or subtitles and audio and image impact on subtitle reading. Uh, if you have word level data, you can interrogate those more closely. So many of these questions you can't really answer with a lot with a high degree of certainty unless you have word level data. If we look at eye tracking then, um, some eye tracking measures are used to study processing of subtitles um, at the global level and they are uh, dwell time or the average time spent on subtitles versus video, for example, fixation counts, fixation durations, uh, the things I've measured before. Less common measures are things like word skipping rates during first pass reading and refixation probabilities, for example. And then local measures are word level measures to study frequency effect. In other words, we know in from reading research that low frequency words, in other words, words that are not common, that are not familiar to the reader, that they are take longer to process. So you have more fixations on those uncommon, unfamiliar words, longer fixations, people tend to make regressions and reread those words more often. Um, word length has, has a similar impact. We can often skip short words, uh, but longer content words, we tend to fixate at least once. We tend to revisit more, more fixations, longer fixations, very highly correlated with word frequency effects. And then you have elements uh, or measures such as a wrap up effect, which means that typically when you reach the end of a sentence or a phrase, there's a longer pause, a longer fixation at the end of that phrase, because that will give you time then to integrate what you've read in, uh, in, in, in the subtitle, in that sentence, into put it into your, your long-term memory. In other words, make sense of it, create the 
uh, the propositional representation of it and store it into your long-term memory and then start making sense of it. If we go into reading research, then we know that skilled reading is a really demanding thing. Because when you're reading, and it's something that comes so naturally to us, it's such an automatic measure. But if we're reading, uh, you have to coordinate vision, attention allocation, your language processing, the working memory, the long-term memory, and also your eye movements. So this means that when you're reading, it's really hard to do other things. When you, this is why you're not allowed to read text messages while you're driving. Um, you, you can't look at the screen and read the subtitles simultaneously. There's a temporary blindness. If you're looking at the image, there's a temporary blindness. If you're looking at the screen, there's a temporary blindness uh, of the other one. So if you then encounter obstacles like unfamiliar words, like uh, ambiguity, like spelling mistakes, then and you get stuck on that, it means that you're processing that more, which means you have less time to look at the rest. So reading can be tripped up. At the same time, viewing can be tripped up. If there's a problem in the subtitle, you have less time. If there's something in the visuals that's complicated to disentangle, uh, then you don't really have capacity left to look at the subtitle. An important thing to keep in mind here is that reading and scene perception are two independent channels and they have very different visual routines. Reading subtitles is a truncated reading routine uh, because you're reading chunks of text at the time and you have to alternate between doing that and looking at the screen. And this changes the reading routine from when you're reading a static text. <clears throat> now, I'm, uh, I sense I'm going to taking a little bit too long here and I know that it's really hard to concentrate on a recorded lecture like this. Um, but if we look at, at this image, I'm going to try to use more visual aids in the, in the second part of this. Um, we can see that uh, in this model, the multimodal integrated language framework, uh, that this accounts more for the visual processing. This is not really incorporated the auditory input yet, although that's part of what we're working on at the moment. But you can see that when you face with the subtitles on a screen and you have the image of a polar bear, for example, and the image of the den of the polar bear, then you can identify those through your visual system with location indexing. Your visual systems also used to look at words, identify words, and then to create feature bindings, putting together letters into words, which will make it possible for you to, to identify words. At the same time, by doing the feature binding between different as aspects, you can identify objects. And that's all in your declarative memory. Then in your working memory, this is processing your working memory to create a text base from the text, which is a propositional representation, and then a situation model or a, uh, yes, yeah, a situation model, which really then in your working memory means that's how you understand everything put together in a particular scene. If it's about a polar bear coming out of a den at the end of winter, then that's your situation model, your, uh, the model that you, uh, mental model that you create in which you understand whatever is going to be presented to you uh, subsequently. And then in, in all of that, you have the sentence processing. And these things really interact, but that's, we don't need to go into all of that. If we, look at subtitle processing then there's been quite a few studies on automaticity and efficiency that subtitles are read automatically whether they read or not is still a little bit open to debate yes they still receive attention but to what extent is that meaningful reading that's something that we haven't quite answered yet um, there are a number of studies that indicate that when you're reading subtitles you can still efficiently look at the screen and this is really a testimony to the human cognitive system. We can adapt, we can process multiple things. So if we're looking at uh, multimodal redundancy, we can say that people can really process multimodal um, scenes very efficiently, but it also triggers and very involuntarily often triggers a checking and a comparison. And because of that, you can see things that pop out. Now, the narrator clearly said something 
else here, something like uh, Naomi is fishing for compliments and the automatic speech recognition uh, misinterpreted that. If we, um, so if we then look at cognitive processing, then we know that it's adaptive and it, it's effective. Um, and I'm going to leave this to you to return to because you will have, have access to, to these slides. Uh, but there are a few studies that indicate that this can be done. If we look at the way people look at scenes, you can see that you distribute attention between different types of source scenes. If you in a classroom, for example, and you have that subtitled, you can look at the text, but you can also look at uh, the lecturer. You can also look at PowerPoint slides. You divide your attention between those. But then our vision is also attracted to things that are salient in the visions, in, in the visuals, which means we tend to look at text because we know that you can extract meaning from that. We tend to look at faces. We tend to look at facial features and also any movement. We also tend to look at the center of the screen and we look at contrast. So all of these things are bottom up measures that attract attention automatically. Um, now, if we're going to look at an example then of how we can put all of these things into practice, then we can investigate something like subtitle speed or presentation rate to see what happens when we speed up subtitles. We've spoken at the beginning about how verbatim subtitles can sometimes be really fast. So what happens when that occurs? Um, a long time ago in 1998, Jensen did a study and, and found that people are comfortable at about 12 characters per second or 145 words per minute. I'm not going to go into those measures. Uh, they're quite self-explanatory and it's open to debate whether 12 characters per second is 145 words per minute or really 120 words per minute, but we don't need to get into that. The bottom line is at a slower speed of 12 characters per second, people are comfortable and they can handle speeds of higher up to 14 characters per second. But what happens when it speeds up faster than that? Um, Sarkovska and her colleagues have done quite a few studies on this. Uh, going back to 2011, 2016, investigated the processing of verbatim standard and edited subtitles. And they found in their studies that there was very little difference in the amount of time spent on the subtitles. Now I'm not doing these studies justice. It's a really an overview, but please go and read them. Then Sarkovska and Gabo Moron in 2018 also found that viewers can process subtitles at speeds of up to 20 characters per second and still follow the images. But then verbatim subtitles have variable speed, and I alluded to that earlier. If we look at uh, an example of this, if I can get this to move, um, we did a quick sample of 11 popular films on Netflix in Australia, and we, we found that in this, even though Netflix set, says 20 cards per second for English is the maximum rate, we found that the average speed for these 11 feature films was about 12 and a half cards per second, which is very decent, very manageable. But then about 30% of subtitles were faster, were between 12 characters and 20 characters per second. So in the, in the still comfortable range. And then about 15% of subtitles were faster than 20 characters per second. Some of them at ridiculous speeds, but I'm, that's probably just a, a blip. Uh, but at the same time, there is clearly a, a big variability, which means that people can't necessarily adapt to faster speeds. So what we it, then uh, just that's just the reality of it. If we just to take you back then to what we did in our studies, um, is we wanted to see what happens when subtitles are faster. So we designed a study, and in order to, to be able to eliminate some of the potential confounds, we kept the volume of the text uh, per subtitle stable. Um, at, we only used one liners. We uh, made sure that between the different videos, we had the same number of words exactly the same text, uh, but presented either at 12, 20 or 28 characters per second. And we did that simply by taking away the audio and then leaving the subtitles on for longer to create soft, slower speeds or taking them off faster so that they were on screen for shorter times for the faster speeds. We also presented the subtitles either with or without video to see what the impact of video is on the processing. 
So we had a two by three study, two conditions with and without video, and then three subtitle speeds. Um, six videos, about 80 subtitles each, and then eight comprehension questions. Now, this is a, uh, a heat map of what happens at 12 characters per second. And you can see here that for uh, our participants, if you combine the data, the red indicates more attention, green becomes less attention, yellow is, is uh, no, I'm not sure. So it moves from a green, some attention to red, more attention. You can see here that mostly, most of the words in the subtitle were covered, especially if you take the perceptual range into account. When you go on to 28 characters per second, you can see more of the participants process the first three words properly, but then not necessarily the rest of the subtitle. Um, I'm because of time, I'm going to skip the videos, which is basically just the same similar thing here at 12 characters per second, you can see this participant could process all of the words even go back to low frequency unfamiliar words like saliva. At 28 characters per second, the participant could only get to saliva and not get past that get stuck there and can't reach all the way to the end. So we examined how video and speed influenced word length effects at the local level and word frequency effect. In other words, do people still at the fast rate spend more time on longer words and on more unfamiliar words, lower frequency words in other words. Um, we also look at a number of the standard measures. In comprehension, we found, and this is not, I don't want to make a lot out of this because the comprehension measures were not very comprehensive, um, but we could see that speed in the red part of the graph here with video, we can see that speed at the high speed comprehension started to suffer. We can see clearly 12, 20, 28 cars per second re resulted in a higher percentage of words skipped. Almost 45% of words are skipped at the highest rate. So just about half of the words are skipped at 28 cars per second, 35% of words at, uh, at 20, and then about 28 at the lower rate, sorry. Uh, then if you look at the percentage of subtitles that are uh, of words in subtitles that are not read, that are at the end, in other words, to what extent subtitles are not read to completion, you can see that about 17% of words at the end of subtitles are not read at 12 characters per second. That goes up to about 19% uh, at 20, and it jumps up to about 24% of words that are not read at the end of subtitles. So subtitles that are not read to completion at the fast rate. Um, we can look at things like revisits, because we know that in order to understand text, you have to make regular regressions, go back to words you didn't understand properly. At 12 cards per second, about 18% of uh, the words were revisited. When you go up to 28 cards per second, it goes down to about 8% of words. Um, after horizontal eye movements, vertical eye movements at 12 cards per second, about 3% of the words are revisited from the image, but that almost disappears at 20 and 28 cards per second. Total reading times go down. So people spend less time at the subtitles, the faster they are, and they make longer saccades between words, which means that they start processing it more superficially. We can see at the slower rates, the black lines at the top, they are the word frequency and word length effects are quite evident. The lower, the shorter the word, or the longer the word, the longer the time. And the lower frequency, the word, the less familiar the word, the longer the time also spent looking at it. But this becomes attenuated. It's, it's less visible at the higher speed. So you still see those effects, which means people still process the words properly, lexically, but it becomes less. Uh, dramatic. Now we did a second experiment which we in which we looked at dual task. We had people either just read subtitles without any visual task or they had to read subtitles while they had to monitor for uh, the full color change. We had a letter appearing every second, changing every second and once in a while that letter would change color and they had to press a button. So that was a low demand task and then a high demand task was they had to look at the letters to see if 
every time it changes from a consonant into a vowel, they had to press a button. Now, in other words, that in that way, we manipulated the complexity of the visuals. And when doing that, we see that um, the number of fixations on the subtitles decrease significantly as the speed increases, uh, which clearly shows that they, because they have to pay more attention to the visuals, they really start processing the subtitles quite superficially. This has a direct impact on their comprehension, which uh, drops dramatically. The, the more complicated the visuals are, the less they understand of the subtitles. And also in terms of their secondary task performance, from the low demand task to the high demand task, there's a significant difference in their response accuracy. In other words, whether they press the button at the right time. It's almost 100% of the color change, but with the vowel change, it drops by about 20%. So what does this tell us about meaningful processing? Uh, we know that pedagogical, it has pedagogical and usability implications. We know that meaningful processing of captions or subtitles is compromised when the presentation read becomes really fast. We know faster subtitles cause more superficial processing. People have fewer shorter fixations, longer saccades. Uh, they skip more words. There are more subtitles they don't read to completion. We know also that as the film complexity increases, uh, they can't process the subtitles as effectively. So the comprehension drops as well. And the comprehension of the visuals also drop. So yes, people can still make out the visuals, they can still read the subtitles, but this processing starts to suffer if any of the two modes become too complicated. So it seems that uh, subtitles are still processed, when the demands increase, but more superficially. So what we can say is it's reasonable to assume that persistently high demands, when viewers have to process fast subtitles or even complex visuals, will have two very or three very important consequences. It was two and then I added the third and I didn't change this. Reading will take priority over scene perception. Uh, reading will become more superficial and also comprehension will suffer. So that's roughly the conclusion that we reached. Now, in conclusion, um, I can say that the, the human mind is adaptable, highly adaptable, and ensuring effective cognitive processing of multimodal text, such as subtitled film, is therefore guaranteed by the fact that we are so adaptable. We did, however, in our research find that the evidence for changes in visual behavior as the demands increase in terms of visual, visual complexity and speed as well. Um, these changes then also ensure that attentional resources are managed to prioritize and maximize processing. So as viewers, we constantly have to adapt. And this is important in trying to understand multimodal processing. There are, however, significant indications that, uh, that there are negative impacts from these increasing demands. Um, so there's a lot of work that still needs to be done and, and you are the people who have to do this work. There's, uh, there's a wide field of research that's still wide open in terms of identifying the minutia in the processing of language in such complex contexts, such complex multimodal contexts, the influence of cultural background, the influence of language, first and second language, all of these things still need to be investigated. Eye tracking gives you a really useful way to do that, but that's by no means the only way to do it. There are much, uh, there are multiple other ways, more qualitative ways perhaps, but combining it also with quantitative uh, uh, methodologies is something that can really uh, lead to very useful and meaningful research outputs. I hope this has been meaningful to you and that you've been able to take something out of this. Uh, you are very welcome to contact me if you have any questions. Um, there are some references that uh, will be part of the slides that you'll get access to. And that is basically all from me. Uh, enjoy the rest of uh, this summer school.